right. Mr. G is officially live, ladies and gentlemen. How's everybody doing? I'm a little disappointed the sun's not out today. Leads me to suspect it's going to be a lot of rain today. Suppose that makes sense. April showers hopefully will bring May flowers. Hopefully that's the case. Well, if you did not see that today was going to be my first day of office hours, I may have to make an adjustment to that if I continue doing my read alods at 11 because my original plan was to have my office hours 10 to noon. So I might go a little past noon today in case any student or family has a question or concern based on what accessing materials on dojo or being able to understand comprehend the materials that were in the packet if you got it if you haven't got it i know it's in the mail so be patient be patient with the mail carriers they are working my understanding is that the mail is running slower and they're is an overabundance of stuff being sent through the mail system and there's less people to process it. So the packets in the mail should get to you guys soon. So be patient. But if there's any way that I can help you guys with any of the materials that I've provided on Dojo, I am more than willing to help you and I could help you after the stream. Make myself a little bit longer since the stream is going to take part of that time. But hopefully you guys are doing well on this Wednesday. It really doesn't feel like Wednesday to me, though. It's just really weird. I was talking with my roommate this morning. And I said, man, I just don't know what day it is anymore. And schedule's all messed up because, you know, you're stuck at home. And they say, yeah, it's quarantine fatigue. And I go, is that really a thing? And I go, yeah, I read about it last night. Yeah, it, it's a thing. And everybody's going through it. So glad I'm not alone. But hopefully you guys are continuing to stay safe, continuing to be healthy. But I think we need to pick up where we left off of Poach yesterday. We kind of left off kind of in a good spot. Um... We left off with Ben talking to Charlie Connor, Larry the Lizard, and Kazoo Actor, because that was one of the suspects that Christy suggested. Charlie obviously wants nothing to do with Kazoo, and he's tired of having the finger pointed at him as, you know, the, the, the primary suspect whenever a crime happens because he happens to be an ex-con. He said that, you know, I would, wouldn't know how to take a zoo. I wouldn't know how to take care of him. And, you know, if you try it, you even know what it would take to fence an animal like that? Because I don't. And honestly, why would you want to try to sell a zoo right now when every law enforcement agency in the state of Texas and in the country is looking for said koala? And you'd have to be not too bright to try to sell that koala right now when the heat is on. So Ben's kind of run into a dead end with that. Um, he also ran into Marge. Marge, very confident, said that she's found new evidence to nail Ben and she was going to be presenting it to J.J. McCracken the next morning. And she was so confident that she said, you know, mark my words later tomorrow, we will come to arrest you and drag you to Juvie Hall. And it would be smart of you to turn over Kazoo now, because then the police will probably give you less of a sentence or less of a punishment. Teddy says very defiantly, I never stole Kazoo. I am being framed. You're looking at the wrong person. And Marge is like, yeah, yeah right. So Teddy talks about what happened with Charlie, what happened with Marge and Houston Astros cap guy with his parents. Parents aren't too happy that he was slucking around Fun Jungle when he was supposed to be at home. But he found out some good things. 
They also discovered the reason why Furious George is going ballistic is because every time he sees someone wearing an orange cap, a visitor, he goes ballistic. And mo and his mom made the connection that this had to be been an abuse. That an abuser wearing an orange cap must have done something so horrible to George that that's the reason why he's losing his losing his mind, getting mad, um, you know, throwing stuff. You know, there was a trauma there. So they made that connection and they realized that Astros Cap was there multiple times when George went off. So he's clearly up to something talking to Freddie Malloy. But he seems also connected to George and whatever happened to him before he came to Fun Jungle that caused such a bad trauma that he's triggered whenever he sees an orange a person with an orange cap. Um, Teddy has also shared, you know, Astro's cap and that with, you know, Summer. Got the license plate. Summer is passing it on to her father to look at that. But while he, while Teddy was with his parents and having all this happen with George, his mom gets a phone call from the personal assistant of J.J. McCracken stating that J.J. wants to see Teddy first thing tomorrow morning. So right about the same time, Marge is supposed to make her big case to J.J. that Teddy is our guy. We need to nail him. So things aren't looking too good for Teddy right now, guys. I hate to say it. I think he's... Unless he finds something credible more than just, you know, these, you know, kind of odd circumstances with other people, there's not a whole lot to go on. At least it has to be something big where JJ has to force Marge to look at someone else seriously to stop building a case against Teddy because she's got a chip on her shoulder against him. So we're going to pick up with chapter 16 titled enemies and maybe maybe we'll get some resolution maybe i don't know we'll find out jj mccracken's office was on the top floor of the administration building it was the nicest office in the entire park which didn't make that much sense given that jj only used it one day a month if that most of the time, he was traveling around the world overseeing the dozens of companies that he owned or cutting deals to buy yet another one. The room was 20 times the size of my mom's office with huge windows that normally offer that normally offered a panoramic view of all of Fun Jungle. Today, however, it was sleeting so badly that I couldn't see a thing. When the secretary showed me showed my parents and me in at 9 a.m. J.J. was already seated at his enormous desk. The size of the office and the desk were probably supposed to signif signify J.J.'s power. But to me, they had the opposite effect. J.J. was a short man, and surrounding himself with big things only made him seem smaller. He looked Kind of like a kid who'd snuck into his father's office. JJ's personality wasn't small. wasn't personality wasn't small at all. However, he was effasively, effasive, opinionated, and spoke in a voice that seemed to come from somebody three times bigger than he was. JJ had grown close to grown up close to where Fun Jungle had been built, and still acted like a local good old boy rather than a Wall Street billionaire. His standard outfit was a denim shirt, a bolo tie, and cowboy boots. When I entered his office, I was worried he might be angry with me. Instead, he seemed thrilled to see my whole family. Well, if it isn't the Fitzroys, he said, three of my favorite members of the Fun Jungle family. 
He came out from behind behind the desk to greet us, shaking Dad's hand, mine, and giving Mom a peck on the cheek, which he he had to stand on his tiptoes to do. I really appreciate y'all coming down here this morning. I know you've got things to do and places to be, like school. Mom pointed out, pointed like said, pointedly nodding toward me. JJ's smile faltered, but only for a second. He wasn't used to people talking to him the way Mom had did. But he always seemed to appreciate her cutting to the chase. You're right, he admitted, then spoke directly to me. It was probably bad form demanding to meet you to meet you right now when you're supposed to be studying. But the fact is, I wanted to talk to you face to face, AS as soon as ASAP. This was the first opportunity I had, and I just flew in from Berlin this morning. He gave me a grin. Don't worry, though, Teddy. If that school gives you any trouble about truancy, tell Principal Dolanet to call my office, and I'll set him straight. I grinned back at J.J. McCracken was the most revered person in all of Central Texas. It was kind of like having the President of the United States offer to write me a note excusing me from class. You really mean that? I never say anything I don't mean, J.J. told me. How is old Lyndon B. Johnson Middle School anyhow? Trumping Jack was ancient when she taught me, and I'm no searching. The old bat must be 200 years old by now. She giving you any trouble? Yes, I said. Mrs. Orton doesn't seem, always seem that fair when it comes to grading Teddy's papers, Dad offered. I wouldn't put too much stock in what Mrs. Orton thinks, J.J. said. She always told me I wouldn't amount to much. He waved to his office. I think we could agree that she missed the mark on that one. J.J. might have been might have happily rambled out about his old teachers all day, but Mom, come off. I'm sure you didn't call us in just to talk about old times, J.J., Right as usual, Charlene, J.J. waved us to a couch and then sat in the large overstuffed armchair, which is saying something. Teddy, I know you've been nosing around in this whole kazoo business. I looked toward my shoes. Either Summer had spilled the beans about me or she had been right that J.J. had seen through her story. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cause any trouble. J.J. laughed. <laughs> Hold on there, kiddo. I'm not planning to tan your hide for this. In fact, I want to thank you. I lifted my head, surprised. On either side of me, Mom and Dad seemed equally caught off guard. You do? Mom asked before I could. Sure, J.J. said. Now, I know there's been some trouble, and I doubt that Teddy's entirely to blame for that. Your son shows gumption, Charlene, and I respect that. In fact, sometimes I wish my security staff here behaved a bit more like him. I glanced at my parents, not sure what to make of this. I'd heard J.J. was was upset with my snooping, but now he seemed pleased with it. So, you don't think I stole Kazoo? I asked the billionaire. J.J. hesitated for a little too long before answering like he was choosing his words very carefully. I'll admit there was a moment or two when I had my suspicions. Not that I doubt that you were up to anything criminal, Teddy, but you do have a reputation for pranks around here. And I thought perhaps this might have been one that had gone a little too far. Now hold on there, Dad began, but J.J. held up his hand to signal that he wasn't finished. All I'm saying is that I'd considered the possibility. He explained. And you have to admit, the evidence was stacked pretty high against your son. Dad backed down. I suppose. Well, that's probably probably all mute now anyhow, J.J. said. In light of what Teddy turned up with his snooping last night. Mom and Dad looked at me curiously, then back to J.J. Is this about Astro's cap, Mom asked. In part, J.J. replied. But the big piece of the evidence Teddy got was the license plate number. Once Summer sent it to me, I passed it to my security division. You mean Marge, I asked. J.J. laughed. No, I mean the security division for my entire corporation. I often have to deal with issues quite a bit more seriously than what normally takes place here. Things like embezzlement, fraud, and corporate espionage. That division is staffed mostly by former FBI agents and the like, who still have plenty of connections in law enforcement, so it wasn't too hard to trace the plate. 
It seems the company was rented by an employee of the Heisenbuch Company. I've never heard of that, Mom said. No, JJ told her, you wouldn't have, because the company is just a front. It doesn't make a thing. Its only purpose is to hide the identity of its owner. And once again, my people know how to get through the bottom of corporate shenanigans like this. The point being, Heisenbach is actually owned by the Nautilus Corporation, which is owned by none other than Walter Ogilvy. Mom and Dad both reacted with surprise. Obviously, they knew who Walter Ogilvy was. I had never heard of the name, though. Who's that, I asked. Another billionaire capitalist, Dad said. Sort of like J.J. here. Walter Ogilvy is nothing like me. J.J. spoke so sharply that he even seemed to take himself a bit by surprise. He hopped to his feet and paced around his office. The man is unethical, greedy bottom feeder whose only talent is leeching off of other companies. He's no better than a common thief. In fact, he's worse. When a thief gets caught stealing, he goes to jail. When Olgavy gets caught, he just bribes his way out of trouble and goes away with the wrist slap. Mom leaned over and whispered in my ear, As you can see, there is some bad blood between JJ and Walter. That weasel stole a dozen ideas from me over the years, JJ was saying. And then he had the had the unmitigated gall to accuse me of stealing the idea of Fun Jungle from him. The man's less trustworthy than a raccoon in a hen house. Dad interrupted. JJ, I think Teddy needs a little more background to understand what's going on here. JJ paused mid rant and swung back toward us as though he had forgotten we were there. Good point, he said, and then focused on me. Even though it is extremely well documented, the idea for this part was generated by none other than my own daughter several years ago. Walter Ogilvy has repeatedly claimed that it was actually his idea. In reality, he was just jealous of the concept and tried to steal it for himself. He made multiple attempts to block the construction of Fun Jungle while racing to build his own animal-based theme park in New Mexico. Zootopia, he called it. He filed injunctions, dragged me to court, cost me an arm and a leg in legal fees. And then when that didn't work, he played dirty, making several attempts at sabotage. I heard that that was never proven, Mom said. Of course it wasn't, J.J. said. Oh, if he's more slippery than a more eel. He's even, he's never had an original thought in his life, but he knows how to cover his tracks. I assure you, though. There was definite sabotage of this park during the construction. I know Ogilvy was behind it. Like what, I asked. World of Reptiles mysteriously caught fire, JJ told me. And there was an explosion at Hippo River. Someone ripped out all the wiring of two dozen bulldozers. Penny anti stuff, really. But it all cost time and energy, and it put the lives of innocent workers in jeopardy. The worst thing is, there wasn't a point to any of it. Olgavi knew I was going to finish on Jungle no matter what. He knew his own park would never be finished before mine. He was just being a sore loser like the kid who sticks tacks in your bike tires because you're dating the girl he has a crush on. Is Zootopia still being built, I asked. And for the first time since the subject of Olgavi had come up, J.J. smiled. No, Teddy, it's not. Olgavi bought a lot of land and started clearing it. And once Sun Jungle opened and grabbed all the press, Olgavi's backers realized they never were, they'd never be able to rival us. So the project got canned, leaving the Nautilus Corporation on the hook for all the cash they had laid out. The whole incident left Olga V feeling like looking like a fool, and yet he still hasn't backed down. He continues to file suits against me, looking for a cut of Fun Jungle's profits, and I've suspected all along that he's not done with his dirty tricks. Teddy, do you recall in the midst of the whole Henry the Hippo investigation, I suggest there might be corporate interests behind Henry's death? Yes, I said, I remember the conversation quite well. It was the first time I had ever met J.J. McCracken. Well, Walter Ogilvy was one of the folks I had in mind, J.J. told me. In fact, he was my primary suspect until the truth had come out. Now, Ogilvy might not have murdered Henry, but it seemed he was still determined to cause trouble here. 
You think he swiped Kazoo, mom ass? I think it's darn likely. JJ circled back behind his desk. The only way Olga V would ever get Zootopia off the ground is to drive Fun Jungle out of business. Now, I won't kid you. We're having a tough go of things right now. We're far below where our numbers ought to be in terms of ticket sales. The Henry business didn't help this summer, and the nasty weather this winter has been really a kick in the knees. Kazoo was proving to be our salvation, and not just in tickets, but in merchandises, merchandising as well. And suddenly, he goes missing. Look at what the what that accomplishes. It takes away a major revenue stream and it makes Fun Jungle look bad once again. Coming on the heels of Henry's death, we look like a bunch of knuckleheads over here. And it's not like we can't get a replacement koala. The Australian government is pitching a fit over this and threatening to sue me for gross negligence. Olgavi couldn't have picked a better way to hurt us. A frightening thought had just occurred to me. Does this mean you're going to build those roller coasters through the animal exhibits after all? JJ looked offended that I even proposed posed the question. I promised Summer that I wouldn't. She convinced me that that was a mistake. I'm not going to go back on a deal with my daughter. I glanced at Mom, unsure if I should believe this. She nodded, signaling that she thought JJ was telling the truth. Okay, I said. JJ unlocked the desk drawer, pulled out some 8 by 10 photographs, and slid them across the desk. Teddy, is this the fellow that you saw snooping around yesterday? I stood up and grabbed the photos. They were all somewhat grainy, as if they had been taken from a surveillance cameras from long distance away. Astro's cap was in each one of them. He was also always wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap. That's him, I said. JJ nodded knowingly. Can you tell me exactly where you saw him? First, he was talking to Freddie Malloy in Koalaville, I reported. And then he went into Shark Odyssey. The main, not the main entrance, but the employee area. He knew the code to get through the door. Malloy must have given him the entry code, JJ muttered. That, nuts job, that nut job's still friendly with the shark keepers. <coughs> he could have convinced one of them to give him the day's code and then passed it on mom tapped the grainy photos of Astro's cat who is he his name is Hank Dunst JJ replied though in certain circles he's known as Hank the Tank Heh, you guys probably like that name Hank the Tank ah uh. He is an employee of the Nautilus Corporation. Officially, he's the vice president of internal development. In truth, he's in charge of doing Olga V's dirty work. You've had your eye on this guy for a while, Dad said. JJ looked at him curiously. Why do you say that? Dad fanned the out the photos. These have been taken over the last year, probably more. The seasons change. Dunce goes from wearing winter clothes to summer ones. His hair changes length. He even seems to have gained about 30 pounds over the course of them. Um, JJ was impressed. I should have known a professional photographer would have picked that up on that. Yes, I've had people keeping tabs on Dunce for a while. We found him in the vicinity of, the tr of trouble several times. He was lurking around here just before the fire at Reptile World of Reptiles, and we've never been able to link him to anything, and now here he is again. Do you know where to find him, I asked? Unfortunately, no, JJ replied. Most likely, he's staying in a hotel under a, an assumed name. What about Freddie Malloy? Mom asked. He must know something. I'm sure he does, JJ said. Only as of this morning, we don't know where either. He called in sick today. But when I sent some people out to his house, he wasn't there. He flew the coop. Do you think he knows we're on to him? Dad asked. It's all, the only thing that makes sense, JJ replied. I'm not sure how, how that happened. Maybe he and Dunt spotted Teddy while here while he was snooping on them. Sorry, I said. I tried my best. 
No need to apologize, JJ told me. There's a ton of other reasons Freddie might have gotten wind. We were out to him. Fact is, we wouldn't have gotten wind of wind if it wasn't for you. If anything, Freddie's disappearance now confirms that he and Duds had both had a hand in this kazoo business. Rest assured, we could find them, though. I've got some of my top men on the case. There was a knock on the door. JJ's secretary poked his head into the office. I hate to bother you, Mr. McCracken, but your call from London starts in two minutes. JJ frowned like he had been annoyed he had to do this. All right. He sighed and handed the photos of Hank Dunst to his secretary. <coughs> Excuse me. Call Mike Middleman at corporate security right now. Tell him Teddy has confirmed it was Hank the Tank on the property yesterday and that he was poking around Shark Odyssey. Do you think we should close the exhibit? The secretary asked. Run it past Middleman and get Pete Thwacker in here. In on it too. He turned back to my family. I'm sorry I have to bring this to a close, folks, but duty calls. We were already on our feet knowing our time with JJ was up. We understand, Dad said. Thanks for taking the time to listen to Teddy. My pleasure. JJ bent to look me in the eye. Although this doesn't give you a free pass to keep snooping, comprende? Hank the Tank is a dangerous man. My people have got the snow, so leave it to us and get to school. All right, I said. You've got a good kid here, he told my folks, and then ushered us out the door. I glanced back at JJ as we passed through the secretary's office. The smile was already gone from his face. Instead, his eyes had narrowed in my direction. JJ quickly forced the smile back on, then closed the door. JJ's secretary saw us to the elevator, and before I knew it, we were out of the administration building again. It was cold and raw outside. The sleet was falling even harder. My parents and I paused under the eaves of the building in a hurry to head out into not in a hurry, in no hurry to head out into it. Nasty weather echoed my mood. I probably should have been happy given that JJ McCracken himself had just complimented me, but I wasn't. What's wrong? Mom asked. I can never hide my feelings from her. I kind of get the feeling that, well, that J.J. was only pretending to be nice to us so he could get the information that he wanted. Dad and Mom shared a look and then nodded. I kind of got that feeling myself, Dad said. Mom pulled my winter jacket tight around me and zipped it up. And now you're upset because after all you've done, he's only giving you a pat on the back and sending you off to school? Sort of, I said. But more than that, I feel like that he wasn't being completely honest with us. <clears throat> like, the deal with him and Walter Olgavy wasn't exactly what he was saying it was. Dad grinned. JJ's right. You are a smart kid. I can guarantee you JJ's version was whitewash. JJ McCracken's no saint when it comes to business. Olgavy is not the only one who, with dirty hands here. Now, now, Mom chided, you're talking about the man who cuts our checks and the man who's given both of us very nice jobs. Jobs that he threatened so he could keep Teddy in line, Dad countered. And now he's acting like that never even happened, like he's been Teddy's biggest fan all along. I'm thankful for J.J. McCracken's jobs, and but I don't trust him. And I know you don't either. Mom frowned. But she didn't deny this. And then Large Marge emerged from the sleep. Bubba Stackhouse was with her. And there were four other police officers with them. They all wore heavy parkas over their uniforms to protect them against the lousy weather. Which made Marge and Bubba even thicker than usual. Well, 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 Marge said with a grin. Isn't this a surprise? I was just on my way to make my case to JJ to arrest you, and here you are. Bubba Stackhouse nodded to his officers who surrounded us. You're wasting your time, Mom said. We were coming from JJ's office right now. He knows who's behind because he was kidnapping. No, he only thinks he does, Marge shot back. I'm sure you folks. Fed him all sorts of lies to keep Teddy looking innocent, but JJ hasn't seen the evidence I've got. And when he does, I can guarantee he'll change his tune. 
What evidence, Mom asked, though. She was trying to hide it. I could hear she was worried. So was I. Marge seemed way too sure of herself. I felt like a young deer that was surrounded by wolves. We just visited your trailer again, Marge said, while you were snowing JJ, and we were inspecting Teddy's room, and look at what we found. Marge held up two evidence bags, one of them with a clump of gray fur that definitely looked like it came from a koala, and the other held several small oblong black pellets. Is that, Dad began, koala fur and koala poop? Marge said, meaning your precious son here has been in possession of the koala recently? I've never seen any of that before, I protested. Someone must have planted it. Marge ignored me completely and turned to the police. Arrest him, she said. You know, I could be mean, and I could end it right there, and then leave you guys on a cliffhanger to find out for tomorrow. I could be mean like that. But you guys are lucky like you guys. I'll read chapter 17 today. Chapter 17, Hank the Tank. Two policemen grabbed me. One forced my hands behind my back while the other whipped out a pair of handcuffs. Get your hands off of my son, Dad shouted. He started toward me, but the other two officers blocked him. You're making a mistake. Just call J.J. McCracken. He'll set everything straight. There's no mistake here, Marge sneered. Your son was the only one at the crime scene, and now we found ironclad evidence that he had a koala in his room. Case closed. Now back off or we'll arrest both of you for interfering with police business. Dad didn't listen to her, even though he was outnumbered, but I could tell he was only thinking of me. Dad had been in plenty of dangerous places before, and he knew how to handle himself. He made a feint around the police and charged toward me. One of the police caught his arm, and tried to twist him back behind him. Dad swung around and slugged the cop in the chin. The cop staggered backwards, shaken. His partner tackled Dad, knocking him around. Bad idea, he snarled. Dad did his best to fight back, but the second cop was now on him as well. They overwhelmed him, pressing him to the icy ground, and the other officer clinched the cuffs around my wrist and started to lead me. No! Mom cried. Teddy didn't do anything, Marge. Dad yelled, he was framed. Face the facts, Marge taunted. Your kid's a bad egg, and he should have been shipped off to juvenile hall long ago. Ma Mom came toward Marge, looking ready to claw her eyes out, but Dad's voice stopped her. No, Charlene, go be get back to JJ's office and tell him what these idiots are doing. Mom obviously didn't want to abandon Dad and me, but she realized she wouldn't be any help if she got herself arrested too. Don't worry, Teddy, she told me. We will get this all sorted out, and you're going to be okay. She raced back toward the administration building. Bubba Stackhouse looked at Marge, unsure what to do. Marge stopped the policemen who were leading me. I can handle the boy, she said, and then handed them a bag full of, the bag full of coal. Run this up to J.J.'s office. When he sees the evidence, he will back us over Mrs. Fitz, Mrs. Fitzroy. The police seemed happy to get an assignment that didn't that asked that took them out of the sleet. They quickly left me with Marge and hurried into the administration building. Bubba turned to the two cops pinning Dad to the ground. Neither looked pleased that Dad had called them idiots. You take Mr. Fitz right to our headquarters and book him for assault. Marge and I will run the kid to Juvie Hall. Dad stopped struggling, aware it would only get him into more trouble. The cops pulled his arms behind his back and cuffed him as well. Then Marge and Bubba marched er me around the corner, and I couldn't see Dad anymore. We passed out of the employee area and into the park. Marge and Bubba each held one of my arms, keeping me squeezed between them. Since my hands were behind my back, none of the tourists approaching us could see the cuffs on my wrists. Instead, I probably looked like a kid on vacation with two very overprotective parents. Not that there were many tourists, 
The nasty weather had kept everyone but the diehards home. I started to feel scared, like really scared. Although I've been worried about March for the past few days, I hadn't expected it would come to this. I figured I would have found the real thief, or someone else would have, or at least Marge would have to come to her would have come to her senses and realized I hadn't done it. Instead, the stakes had been upped against me, and my parents hadn't been able to protect me. Even more disconcerting, however, was the fact that whoever had stolen Kazoo had planted evidence against me. Originally, my being at the crime scene had seemed like mere dumb luck. I was in the wrong place and at the wrong time. But now, I had to wonder if that was true. Just as my father had first warned that the morning after, the real thief obviously knew I had been suspected of the crime and had taken further steps to further implicate me. Had I been set up all along then? How much did the thief know about me? As though, as the thought, of, as I thought about this, something occurred to me. Why did you decide to search our trailer again? I asked. Because we did. That's why, Marge said. Although she couldn't keep her eye on me, co eye contact with me, which I figured meant she was lying. I turned to Bubba. What really happened? We got a tip. The cop replied. Marge spun on him, annoyed that he spilled the beans, but he shrugged it off. It's no secret, Marge. He has a right to know. What kind of tip? I asked. A police call. A phone call, Bubba told me. Yesterday afternoon. I thought back to Marge confronting me outside the costume room the day before. She'd been so confident she must have just gotten the call. From who? I asked. Bubba shrugged. It was anonymous. The caller claimed that they'd seen the koala at your place. That's a lie. I said, I've never had the koala there. The evidence says otherwise, Bubba countered. It was planted, I told him, probably by whoever called you. They set me up. You should be arresting them, not me. Oh, so it's a conspiracy against you, Marge Dass. I said, if I took Kazoo, where is he now? You tell me, Marge growled. I was about to argue further, but something caught my eye. A glimpse of orange in the distance. I peered through the sleet. A th thick-set man with an orange baseball cap was post passing the polar pavilion. He was moving away from us, so I couldn't see his face. But I thought I recognized the lumbering gait. Hank the Tank. He was heading back towards Shark Odyssey. There, I shouted. That's the guy you should be arresting, not me. I reflexively tried to point, but couldn't because my arms were still cuffed behind my back. Who, Bubba asked. That guy in the orange Astros cap by Polar Pavilion. His name is Hank Dudson. He works for Alt Walter Olgavy. JJ was just telling me about him. That's the guy who took Kazoo. Can the lies, Marge told me. What do I look like to you, an idiot? Almost any other time I would have answered yes. But right then, I was at Marge's mercy. I don't see anyone, Bubba said. I looked up toward Polar Pavilion again. Sure enough, Hank had disappeared. There was simply too much sleep to see him. He was there, I insist. He's probably heading for Shark Odyssey. I saw him poking around there yesterday. JJ says he does the dirty work for Olgavy, and he wants to bankrupt Fun Jungle. Hank stole Kazoo, and now he's planning to do something in the Shark Tank. The only person who's messed with the Shark Tank lately is you, Marge sneered. Just call JJ and tell him Hank the Tank is here, I pleaded. It'll only take a few seconds. Marge didn't even respond to me. Instead, she turned to Bubba. Don't pay any attention to him. You can't trust a thing that comes out of this kid's mouth. I'm telling the truth, I shouted. If you don't listen to me, something very bad is going to happen at this park, and it's going to happen on your watch. And if you don't shut your trap, I'm going to tape it shut, Marge snapped. I turned my attention to Bubba, who seemed at least a little more reasonable. Please, Mr. Stackhouse, I'm not as bad as Marge says I am. She only has an in for me because I once swapped her black jelly beans with rabbit poop. Bubba wavered. For a moment, I thought I'd gotten through to him, but then he shook his head. We were almost to the front gates. A tourist family was now coming through 
the turnstile, braving the lousy weather, two parents and three kids, all about around my age. I wasn't thrilled about what I had to do, but Marge and Bubba weren't leaving me any choice. Help! I yelled to the tourists. I'm being kidnapped! Help! The tourists looked at Marge and Bubba, alarmed. They backed away, not wanting to get involved. Help me! I screamed like my life depended. Please! You're my only hope! The father reluctantly stepped forward, blocking Marge and Bubba's path. What's going on here? He asked. Don't listen to this kid, Marge told him. I'm with Park Security. No, she isn't, I yelled. She's only pretending to be. They grabbed me into the world of reptiles when my parents weren't looking. Normally, my ruse probably wouldn't have worked, but today, Bubba and Marge's parkas were concealing their official uniforms. Ma the mom pulled out her cell phone. I'm calling the police, she said. Wait. Bubba held up a giant. I am a cop, and I can prove it. Let me show you my ID. He let go of me and unzipped his parka. I spun away from Marge, retching my arm free from her grasp. Bubba realized it was a snake and tried to grab me, but Marge lunged for me at the same time, and they slammed into each other. Marge slipped on the patch of sleet, stumbled, and pulled Bubba down with her. The tourists watched it all, unsure what to do. The mother still had her phone in her hand. Tell the cops to come to Shark Odyssey, a fun jungle, I told her, and then took off. It isn't easy to run with your arms cuffed behind your back, but I did my best. Charging toward the shark exhibit as fast as I could. Mama scrambled to their feet and came after me. Both were seething anger with anger, which seemed to make them faster than usual. Between that and my slower-than-average pace, they closed the gap on me as we raced through the park. Marge kept yelling at people to stop me, but I kept yelling at people to stop her and Bubba instead. No one seemed sure about what to make of the situation. I had been much, If I had been much older, I probably would have gotten away wouldn't have gotten away with it, but a few tourists around seemed to doubt Marge's claim that a 12-year-old boy could be a wanted criminal, so no one intervened. They all simply stood back and hoped someone else would handle things. Marge and Bubba got the, onto their radios. Bubba called the two cops he'd left to charge a dad, while Marge put out a general APB to all Fun Jungle security. I'm in hot pursuit of Teddy Fitzroy in connection with the kidnapping of Kazoo the Koala. Indeed, backup. All available security personnel, please respond. We are proceeding along Arctic Way. Tell them we're heading for Shark Odyssey, I yelled. They can't ambush me there. I knew the park well enough that if I wanted to, I probably could have given Bubba and Marge the slip, but that what that would only have bought me a little more time. However, if I could get a few dozen security agents to converge on Hank the Tank, they could catch him and maybe get him to confess that he's stolen the koala and not me. As I neared Shark Odyssey, there still was still no sign of Hank. I wonder if he had already gone inside, or if he was even there. It occurred to me that I merely assumed Hank was heading to the sharks. If he wasn't, I just made a huge mistake. I could see several other security guards closing in on the exhibit from various directions. Even though I'd seen Hank through the security door before, I couldn't do it. I didn't know the code, and if I had... I couldn't have entered it with my hands locked behind my back. I still wanted to draw security inside, though. Some tourists were coming out of the exit as I arrived, holding the door open. I barreled through them. Circle around to the entrance, Marge ordered to the security guards. We'll trap them inside. Then she and Bubba came through the exit as well. I charged into the shark tube. For once, it was devoid of tourists, a sign of what a slow day it was at the park. However, Bubba was barreling down on me halfway through, and he snagged my arm. Gotcha, he wheezed, exhausted from the run. Marge staggered into the tube, even more worn out than Bubba. She was so winded that I thought she was going to throw up. Nice work, she asked. A few sharks swam past us outside the tube. I was suddenly overcome by a very bad feeling. If Hank Dunce was plotting something at Shark... At Shark Encounter, the tube at the bottom of the tank now seemed like the worst place to be. We have to get out of here, I said. Bubba and March didn't move. They were both too wiped out from their run. 
Bubba glared at me as though he was angry, but I made I made him exert so much. We'll go when I say it's time to go. You don't understand. Something bad is about to happen here. I tried to pull free of Bubba's grasp, but he wasn't going to let go of me anyway. Let me get any away with that again. Instead, he clenched my arm tight. Marge was right, he told me. You can't be trusted, so do us all a favor and shut your trap. We're in danger, I yelled. You never learn, do you, Teddy, Marge asked. At both ends of the shark tube, metal doors slammed shut, sealing us inside. I do learn, I said. You just never listen. Now Marge and Bubba finally grew concerned. What are those doors for? Bubba asked, eyes wide with fear. Safety, Marge told him. They seal off the rest of the exhibit just in case something goes wrong with the shark tube. But we're in the shark tube, Bubba wailed. In the space of a few seconds, he'd gone from imposing to terrified. Rather than be the big, tough policeman, he now seemed like a little kid. I don't like sharks. I don't like them at all. I'm sure it's nothing, Marge said, although she didn't sound seem to believe that herself. Just a glitch in the security system. It's not a glitch, I told her. It's Hank the Tank. I told you he was up to something bad. Bubba let go of me. He's He stared at all the sharks circling above us and trembled in fear. I ran to the closest metal door and kicked it. It, I, it didn't do a bit of good. The steel door was sturdy as a sequoia tree. Help! I yelled. Is anyone outside? Help! There was no response from the other side of the door. I looked up through the glass ceiling, wondering if any of Marge's security guys were in the viewing area above. If so, there was a chance that they could see us down in the tube. I couldn't make out anyone, although it was tough to see through all the water. Above us, Taurus, the bull shark, slid past an ominously. I really don't like sharks, Bubba whimpered, and I'm not so good in enclosed spaces either. Now that I was looking up, I noticed something else in the tube. The ceiling wasn't entirely glass. It was supported by 20 feet of steel ribs, which arced around the tube. Along the central rib, a thick wad of what looked like gray Play-Doh. Normally, I might have thought that it was some kind of sealant for cracks in the glass, but there were wires snaking out of it. They connected to a small receiver that was taped to the steel rib. What is that? I asked. Bubba glanced up at it. I wouldn't have thought it was possible, but he grew even more frightened. Get away from it, he yelled. It's an explosive. We all scrambled to the far end of the tube and flattened up against the steel door. The receiver beeped. Don't look at it, Bubba ordered. I turned away and tucked into a ball. The putty then exploded. It wasn't a huge blast. If it had been outside, it probably would it wouldn't have even been that loud. In the enclosed tube, however, it echoed like crazy. The concussion of air hit me, and the scent of acrid smoke filled the filled the air. And then I heard a, the cracking. I spun around. Smoke drifted along the top of the tube above us. The blast had spooked the sharks, which all darted about wildly. A web of cracks was spreading quickly through the glass in the center of the tube. Water began dripping through, raining onto the floor. The cracks grew bigger as the water pressed down from above. The glass wasn't going to last much more than a few seconds. And when it went, the shark tube was going to be flooded with us inside it. Okay, now I'm going to be really mean. That That is another good cliffhanger. We're going to stop there today. So, is Teddy going to survive? Is Marge and Bubba really going to take him to the juvenile hall? Is he going to go to juvie? Is he going to go down for this? Is Hank the Tank going to get away with, you know, basically committing a terrorist act at Shark Odyssey? Yeah, we'll find out when I read the book tomorrow. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me today. If you guys have any questions, comments, or concerns, or need some help navigating the materials that I shared, whether it's in the packets, if you ended up getting the packet, or if you're accessing materials on Dojo that I've posted there, 
just shoot me a message on Dojo, and I will make a little bit of time to help you guys out. Oh, you're welcome, Zach. Glad you liked the two chapters I read today. So, yeah, families, if you have any comments or concerns also, you're more than welcome to message me on Dojo. I'll make a little bit of time before I take a lunch to kind of assist. You know, and like I said, this is, you know, my first planned office hours. And like I said, if I keep the read a lot at this time, I might have to make an adjustment. And if I need to add more, kind of depends on what your families need right now. So let me know. I'll be hanging out for like, for sure, like for the next 30 minutes. And I'll make myself available to help out then. So I'm going to sign off now. I will see you guys tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.